Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks very much for joining us this evening for the screening of 76 Days. We have with us uh, the director of the filmmaker, Hao Wu, with us. Um, we're hoping to get to as many questions as we can. For those of you who are able to um, um, join us, uh, send us questions or comments. I'm sure Hao Wu is interested in what you, what you thought of the film as well as the questions that you might have. So. Um, how well, congratulations again, and thanks very much for joining us. This is a this is a really extraordinary piece of work. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Doug. It's been great. It's great to be here. So I'm going to get things uh, started until some other questions come. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our radio conversation, uh, how well, is that um, how this all began for you? Say a little bit more about that for those who weren't able to hear that. You've talked about the things that you were doing, um, um, you know, you had when you were you had to educate yourself about what was happening. But in those early days, w before it was, you know, a, a concept. What did you What did you want to know? What did you want to learn about this? Absolutely, story? yeah. So I, I think, Doug, we talk we talked in the past that, like, as a filmmaker, usually I tend to focus on character driven stories. I, I, I tend to shy away from newsy topics just because like if all the media is covering a new story, I don't know as a storyteller, what, what else can I bring to a particular topic? But I guess for COVID-19, it really has become personal for almost everyone on this planet. Um, I flew back to, to Shanghai. Uh, I, I, I live in New York. I, I have a family here with, with, with two kids. Um, I flew back to Shanghai on January 20. Third last year, because I wanted to spend Chinese New Year with my family. Because both my parents have cancer, I wanted just them to spend as much time with my uh, with their grandchildren, my kids, as much as possible. But then, 24 hours before the flight, we learned about this Wuhan lockdown, and in early January, we learned a little bit about this mysterious pneumonia cases coming out of Wuhan. But nobody was paying that much attention. But all of a sudden, it seems like, wow, it's a big deal. They're locking down the entire city of Wuhan. So it came as a quite a shocker. And my partner and I, we discussed, we debated, we talked so, um, for hours. And in the end, I flew back by myself without my partner or my kids uh, to Shanghai, even though Shanghai is quite far from Wuhan. But as soon as Shang uh, Wuhan went into lockdown, the rest of China pretty much voluntarily shut down. So to be in, Shanghai during Chinese New Year, China's largest family holiday, and also Shanghai being Chinese, uh, China's largest city, 21 million people, but there was nobody on the street. It was an uh, absolutely amazing sight and also very eerie feeling. It's, just, it's like, wh where am I? Uh, and we, we pretty much stay indoors and looking through the social media, trying to figure out what's happening in Wuhan. Why is it, uh, how did it become so bad? China has SARS in 2003, how can we you know, make the same mistakes again? So, so in early February, when I came back to New York, when a US network approached me to make a film about this Wuhan outbreak, I jumped down because I wanted to find out what, was hap what, what happened, what, what had happened. And even later on when the US network dropped out, I continued on independently because my, my instinct at that time, just like a lot of people is that we have so many questions. We have so, so much confusion and anger. We wanted to find out what happened. You know, one of the things that you've talked about is that you, you, you were interested at least later in the way human beings behaved, interacted during a catastrophe. Like it seemed like that was one thing that interested you. But what, did you have that in mind early on or was that something that came to you later as an idea? It definitely came in later. I think a couple of things happened. Um, so as documentary filmmaker, we always say, the film we make is, uh, is a result of, com basically is a result of what we want to do versus what we can have access to. So. Starting early February, I, I reach out. I started reaching out to reporters and filmmakers who have started filming in Wuhan, and I just found these two wonderful filmmakers who whose footage really shook me. I, I remember the first batch of rushes I received from them, just as a sample of what they had done. I started crying. It, it's actually the opening scene of the nurse running down the hallway to say, uh, wanting to say goodbye to to her dead father. 
I just remember I was like, wow, uh, because by at that time that was already like almost approaching the mid February. By that time, I have read so much about the outbreak in Wuhan. Um, it's but it's all text. It's text based. Um, you know, I've seen some cell phone footage shot uh, shared on social media, uh, but just to you know, my my co-director footage really like brought me there to in the eye of the storm. So. I remember I was shaken by at that time. I was like, I really want to work with them because their footage, even to this day, till this day, I still feel their footage is so unique uh, because I haven't seen it elsewhere at all. So, but in, in the meantime, as you know, I wanted to do investigative journalism, but then really quickly I ruled that one out because um, first of all, the Chinese, some of the Chinese publication at the beginning of the outbreak, the, the government really wasn't didn't have time to control the media yet. There was a lot of groundbreaking investig investigative journalism pieces coming out of China and Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they were all doing great, great work in China. I mean, I, I couldn't get better access than they do. I don't want to regurgitate what they already said in their pieces. And secondly, just because the nature of documentary film, right? That with, with print, you could potentially uh, interview, talk to someone and write about them anonymously. But with, with video, you cannot do that. So, so, so that's what, so I quickly rule out to, to do an investigative piece during the COVID-19, you know, sort of outbreak in, in Wuhan really quickly. And then, as the pandemic started hitting other countries, as I observe how mo most of the government fumble in their response to trying to contain the outbreak in their respective countries, right? So that kind of like make me a lot more nuanced in terms of how I view China's early response and become less angry to some extent. So instead, because I was in touch with filmmakers in Madrid and Italy and South Korea, and also I myself started filming in New York as well. What I saw was actually the similar stories being replayed over and over in you know, all the different cities and all the different countries. So that kind of guided me to focus more on what what can I do with the footage from Wuhan? What kind of universal story can I tell about this pandemic? So you were able to work with uh, these filmmakers in in China, as you said, for uh, remotely at first. But I, I think you mentioned it was by the end of March that the tensions between the United States and China started to grow, and that that the partnership just stopped working. They they weren't interested, or they were nervous about working with you, and then. I think as you as you tell it, they they came back. You were able to work with them again, and I just wondered: Have you been in contact with them lately? Do, have, have they seen the film? Um, answer that first, and I also want to know if whether what the Chinese government might think of it, if you have any way of knowing. Yeah, I, I think for my co-directors, obviously, we 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 discuss uh, so so for a period of time because the, there's so much geopolitical finger pointing between the US and China, and they grew naturally nervous because we never met in person. We never collaborated before. I reached out to them over the phone, introduced right. by some common friend. I uh, started working together. Um, and so what I did was pretty much, I just edited out the entire Rafka really quickly. I showed them as I, 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 like tell, I told them that I respect how you capture the image because as you could see from the cinematography in the film, they have so much empathy and respect for the people for, and they pay so much attention to uh, a lot of the details, right? Happening in a, such a extreme, under extreme circumstances. So I, I, I said, I, I told them I wanted to respect how you capture the image. And this is a story I want to tell, which is, which is basically how human beings can support each other to live through uh, in times of crisis. And uh, I want to tell a universal story rather than, you know, just honing on the uh, political commentaries about what happened in Wuhan, which has been done <clears throat> a lot by, by media, right, in media. So they, I got them around, they, they saw the Rafka, they, 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 they trusted me finally, and we started collaborating together. Yeah, so, um, but uh, I, I think they, they are very proud of the film. And, yeah. but to, but the, at the same time, um, one of the reason, um, you know, the reason one of the co-director opted to remain anonymous, uh, first of all, because he work, uh, he's a reporter for a state-owned media company. So he's always within the state sector. 
uh, he will, he's not sure how the government would perceive this film because uh, despite the lack of political commentary, it's really telling the harrowing stories of how chaotic, how, how much panic there was in the beginning of the pandemic, of the lockdown, and how much tragedy had happened. So he wasn't sure how the government would perceive it. And more importantly, because just like social media everywhere, in China, there's a growing population of very nationalistic internet trolls mm. that will go after you uh, mm. if they perceive you to portraying anything negative about China. Oh. So, 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 so that's why he did that. A week and a half ago, 76 days. Uh, so ever since we premiered and Toronto International Film Festival, we declined all interviews from Chinese language media because we didn't want to have a lot of exposure in China. That we don't want people in China to know we had this film out. But then a week and a half ago, it started trending in China. I think it's right after we start, we, 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 we talk on the radio. It's a little bit over a week ago because somebody, uh, an influencer on China's Sina Weibo, which is China's equivalent of Twitter, with, that influencer had 19 million followers. He picked up some trade news here in, this, in the US about 76 days being a strong contender for the Oscars this year. So he posted the trailers online in, on Chinese social media and even went viral. Everybody like, and then pirated copies of the film went everywhere. We couldn't even like remove them fast enough in China. So while most of the people appreciate the filmmaking, but there's, you know, there are a number of people basically going after this film without having even watched it, accusing it of catering to the West because we release in the US and people in the US like the film. That's ev evidence enough that we're catering to the West. We are criticizing China anyway. So it's been a crazy <laughs> experience. So now I fully understand why Anonymous opted to remain, to remain anonymous. anonymous. Yeah. You know, I have to say though that to your point that you made earlier, you were saying China wasn't the only country that 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 stumbled in those early days of this. Everybody did. The United States, in particular. Um, so, so it'd be hard to see how this beautiful, touching portrait of human beings inter, you know, interacting with each other would imply some sort of criticism of any government, really. Um, so I, I can't imagine why the government would be upset by it. But again, do you have any sense whether the any Chinese official or the government itself has has seen it, what they think of it, any idea at all? I, I mean, I haven't got any call from the from any government official. Um, I don't know. I think I think it probably. I don't. I honestly have no idea because yeah. all all the re response I've got so far from the social media from the internet users. Yeah. So. There, there's definitely a divergent view in China. Some people appreciate what I'm doing, which is humanize, which is humanize the people on the ground. And but there's a other, you know, the other group of patriotic internet trolls who who just attack me personally, uh, actually, as well as the film, because we are US based. Yeah. It, uh, there's a question from a, a viewer tonight, Ray, who's wondering whether or not you had to get uh, the, the filmmakers had to get permits to do the shooting in the, hosp in the hospital there, of course. Um, uh, the, we here in the United States have these, you're probably familiar with the HIPAA laws, the laws of privacy related to healthcare providers and patients and those kinds of things. And I'm wondering, is there anything like that in China? Did you have to, like, what was, how complicated was going around that process if there was a process like that? To be honest with you, I think it's much more difficult to get access to a hospital during COVID in the U.S. than in China. Mm -hmm. I tried that myself. Uh, I live in New York. When when um, the pandemic hit New York, I tried to get into hospitals. It's not just the HIPAA laws, right? It's also the hospitals afraid of liability issues. Uh, uh, yeah, it was so difficult. In China, obviously, the access to the um, hospitals were controlled. It was, it was and the cashes were limited to patients, medical workers, and reporters uh, during the time of the crisis. But in the beginning of the lockdown, because the situation in Wuhan was so chaotic, so so first of all, in China, because it's all based on human rules, so a lot of times it's really up to the individual chief of the hospital whether 
the individuals, those individuals will grant certain access to the reporters. And both my co-directors of reporters, my Wei Shi Chen is a video reporter for Esquire China, even though he wasn't sent by Esquire China to cover this uh, lockdown because that's not the regular beat of Esquire anywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, um, but he, he's an aspiring filmmaker himself. He just wanted to be there to document history in the making. So he embedded himself with a medical team that was being sent to support hospitals in Wuhan. And, and the hospital in Wuhan, because he was embedded with the hospital already, the, uh, the medical team already. So the hospital view him as part of the medical team. So, so they granted him access. And my other co-director anonymous, he's a photojournalist with a local state-owned newspaper in, in Wuhan. So he already knew a lot of the hospital chiefs and the doctors and whatnot. So he had legitimate reason to be there taking photos for reporting purposes. And that's how he can access. Obviously some other hospital, nobody could get in. There were two hospitals where even the medical staff were infected. Uh, you know, they were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were dying. So nobody could get, get in there. But, but it's just like, you know, going back to, it's really up to the individual hospital chief to grant access. And once you gain access, nobody was watching your shoulder because there was so much chaos yeah. and, and, and you can pretty much run free. And for the hospital chief, one of the motivation for them to grant access at the very beginning of the lockdown is that they want people outside Wuhan to know what was truly happening because they needed the PPEs. There was a severe shortage of PPEs. So they wanted people to know how bad the situation was so people would donate and good medical supplies would be shipped over to Wuhan. Hmm. Here's a good question from a, a viewer. Nova wants to know, did the color of the tape symbolize rank in the hospital? Um, and that was one of the things that you and I talked a little bit about uh, how in, in the interview, just how you were able to see, and those who, who speak and read Mandarin were able to see the names that were written on the back of the PPE, but there were certain characteristics that clearly Nova noticed the tape um, that, that distinguished people. What, what, what about that? Did, did tape distinguish rank? And talk a little bit of just about, uh, about that, may, maybe that process. Yeah, I, I, I think they were using all sorts of ways trying to, you know, so to tell individuals apart because in those hospitals, I think two weeks after the start of the lockdown, China started ship, even, I think, yeah, I don't exactly remember when it happened. China really started shipping volunteer medical workers into Wuhan, right, to support a local hospital because the, uh, they were overwhelmed by, by patients. So, so, so obviously, right, but then th this kind of newcomers have, you know, and the, the original staff, they didn't know each other. So, so in addition to writing their names on the back of, uh, on the, back of the PPEs, so I think different color of the PPEs, the different mm -hmm. color on any given day indicates whether the person is a nurse versus a doctor. That's some simple ways that we're doing, but it's not uniformly applied on every single day because just because the, the, the shortage of PPEs, and it's not like every day they have the, the, the luxury, right? Or pick and choose and assign different colors. Um, it, because it's a lockdown that uh, leads to this really good question from Li Lu who wants to know, were the hospital workers allowed to go home during that 76 days? Were they, or were they, did they make them stay, stay there in the hospital? For local staff, they actually when they have the option to go back home, uh, but for um, t medical teams, and, you know, for, sent from elsewhere to support, there are specific quarantine hospitals where you mm -hmm. go, you have your own room, you stay there after work. As, but uh, a lot of the local medical workers actually opted to stay at those hospitals because they didn't want to bring the infection back home. Uh, and also because there was a severe shortage of transportation means. Uh, you saw in the film, one of the volunteers was, was driving, you know, the pregnant you know, woman and her husband to the hospital. In those days, during the lockdown, especially in the early days, there's no cabs even. You, you, you know, even medical worker had to rely on these volunteers who self-organized to even to drive medical work, local, local medical staff between, you know, their homes and the hospitals. You, you were mentioning trying to shoot as much as you could in New York. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned also sort of reaching out to filmmakers in other countries. Did you have in mind at some point during the process a more global sort of film, a film that encompassed not just China, but the then contrasting it with the other places? Did you have that in mind at some point? Absolutely. I think that that's one of the... So faced with this pandemic, right, a lot of us, our instinct is to ask, how did this happen? So that, 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 that went with my initial investigative phase of wanting, why I wanted to do this film. The second phase was watching this travel, traveling globally is that, what can we talk, you know, what can we say about the global aspect of the pandemic? That's the second instinct. Um, but I think in the end, it really comes down to, based on my conversation, based on my own experience shooting in New York, is that for a film, documentary film to work is really about access. It's about what type of footage you can have, what kind of character you have access to, to tell a compelling true story. So I just didn't, I, 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 I wasn't able to find anyone in, in, you know, also outside of Wuhan to be able to, you know, to, to supply uh, equally compelling footage as my co-directors have shot in Wuhan, including my own, you know, I, I can shoot decently look, decent looking footage. I, I film homeless shelters in New York. I film doctors who have their pro or private practices. I, I film New York like be completely abandoned, nice visual, but I didn't have, com you know, good access to a hospital to film like the front line. So in the end it was like, since the same stories have been replayed over and over again, why do I need to tell quote unquote a global story just by doing local, the local can tell the global. Yeah. I think also, at least my reaction to it was, this was the epicenter of it. And it was, it was in, in such early moments that, that that was a powerful thing for me, realizing that they did not know the extent of the, the you know, the contagious nature of this. They didn't know how dangerous it was. I mean, there were so many things they didn't understand that they didn't know. And the intensity of just that first 76 days really, I think, um, distilled the experience for me anyway, and I'm guessing for other, for other viewers. So I think it was the right call. <laughs> yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, I, th I think that now looking back at some of the things that they did in the film, right, were obviously very extreme, like they would tape over any openings and they were so scared, uh, afraid of that. So I, because of that, because my co-director had to go through that ritual of, you know, so like uh, suiting up and, and beginning of the day and taking everything off at the end of the day. So this, they really suffer. It's, it was a really difficult filming experience for me. One of our, our viewers wants to know, Menke wants to know um, if you could say more about the role of the, the neighborhood committee. Do, do you know what he's, what they're asking there? The, what, the role of these neighborhood committees, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the reason that lockdown in a Chinese city like Wuhan worked especially to try to keep people like, you know, if you are not sick, if you are sick or if you are infected, the government sends you to a hospital or a quarantine center where you, you cannot possibly infect your families or your neighbors, right? So, but then for the regular resident for, um, so what Chinese, the government did was severely restrict freedom of movement. So like, like in, the, in one of the scenes in the film, all the residents, they can stay in their own apartment compound or community that's usually gated with a big gate at the end. So you can, they, can, they can lock you in. And you are only allowed, depends on, you know, in the most severe stage of the lockdown, you can only come out of the house like once or twice a week to pick up groceries and the gate. Uh, so it's a really extreme, severe form of quarantine. Mm -hmm. And it succeeded in China because China had all these very localized grassroots lo um, neighborhood committees that basically in the old days, it was part of the communist party grassroots organization to propagate the ideology. Uh, for a while, mm -hmm. they my understanding is that they were fading away. <laughs> but then during this pandemic, it become really useful, uh, two things. 
three things to pass information to each individual household to say, okay, in order to protect us, we need to do this. Secondly, to make sure people stay inside. Thirdly, to supply to uh, to to supply med medications and you know daily necessities like groceries to the door whenever it's necessary. Because some days, it depends on the neighborhood. Some neighborhood you are not allowed even to step out of your, the door of your apartment. Yeah, but but then but then because neighborhood committee they, they, they implemented such a strict control of who can even go inside the apartment compound the community, it's really hard to film them. That's why we don't have a lot of good footage. That's why we didn't even talk about that in the film. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So so wait, so they did they self organize or were they? given mandates and, and things to do from the government? Or did, was this just them doing this on their own, these committees? I, 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 these committees are, uh, based on my limited understanding, I just want to call it, um, you know, uh, they are like, they are part of the Communist Party organization. It would be like, you know, the volunteer get, you, uh, get out of the vote organizations that yeah. works yeah. for the respected party during election time, except these committee, these volunteer groups, semi-volunteer groups, because they do get paid by the party. They exist throughout the year. Got it. Here's a great question from uh, Maureen, who she, she writes in, she says, as a new mom myself who had a, her child during the height of the pandemic here in Utah in April, how are little Penguin and her parents doing? Any idea? <laughs> They're doing great. I, I think my co-director, Anonymous, who, who filmed her, just talked to her recently. I think uh, they are re reunited with, uh, uh, with the mother's parents. The mother's parents are helping taking care of the baby. Uh, they're doing great. Little pe penguin is going really well. Good. Uh, Vicky wants to know if you could talk about the decision, something that we had talked about in the radio interview. You had done some interviews. Um, you had graphics that you had in mind, but in the end, you decided to just make it a purely verite experience. You stripped out the interviews, you stripped out the, um, the you know, the graphics, the title cards, stuff like that. Um, Vicky wants to know um, whether or not is this a movement within documentaries? I mean, clearly, it's an old, an older style, one that it, it, you drew on influences from from documentary filmmakers who did verite work before. So, talk a little bit about that. And say something about something that you had mentioned. You said that um, that you you just wanted to focus on the emotional stories playing out. So talk a little bit about that style element, if you would. Yeah. So uh, all my film have been uh, different. Um, so in the past, like all in my family on Netflix was a purely personal documentary. I, I'm the one filming behind the camera most of the time. I also happen in front of, you know, I also appear in front of the camera. I personally narrate because it's my personal family story. And um, people's Republic Desire is a black mirror, you know, sci-fi, almost looks like a sci-fi story about internet and cele internet celebrities. But with this film, I actually did struggle in the beginning of the editing process. Like, right? mm -hmm. what is the film? What, what would be the final film be, be, be like? Because when my co-director were filming at the beginning, right, uh, during, during the production process, it was absolute chaos. You know, uh, the one day they would think this person character might be a main character we can follow through, and then that character might be transferred to a different hospital or might, you know, got so bad physically that he or she could not talk or even passed away. So, so you know, when I had, when I started editing, I had all these wonderful emotional moments and character vignettes, but there's no traditional, like in the current days, you know, the, what's popular in documentary storytelling mode is that you follow certain main character, you tell them, tell their journey to a process, to a period of time, and you have interview with them every once in a while to understand their motivation and the backstories. But we couldn't do any of that because, you know, it, whatever we found, by the time we started editing, we cannot even go back to do pickup shoots anymore because it's over, the lockdown is over. And then the sit down interviews, we, we, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of time destroys the intensity of the very tight moments. So I personally, I, 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 I struggle for, 
for a while. And then I remember the good old documentary film in the old days of just like very observational. So yeah, I made a conscious decision to go back, revisit the masters and to learn from them, to really go back to say, let's not try to our point of view that explicit. Let's just be patient, observe what's going on. And uh, yeah, and, 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 and like I mentioned earlier, like the more I think about this pandemic, the more I saw how other governments fail, I feel like it's almost like inappropriate or premature for me to make any political commentary, either by using some, you know, news clip or some other journalist commentating in the news, um, you know, just like why don't why can't we just make make a, a purely observational film about humanity's battling a virus? Because you know, obviously there are films to talk about to be made about this politics. Uh, here in the U.S., we had a wonderful film. Alice Gibney is, you know, totally under control. And I know other filmmakers, friends of mine making political film about China as well during COVID. But at the same time, my personal feeling is that, you know, despite our political differences and our, the difference in our political, you know, government, the, the government forms, we face a common enemy, which is a virus. So that may be something I could say based on the footage I have access to. And that's what we decided in the end, you know, to do. It was a very strong Frederick Wiseman vibe going on there that I loved. Yeah. Um, and I know you had mentioned that he was at least one of the influences that you had thought about. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely re revisited a lot of the Wiseman films. You know. Yeah. Um, a question about uh, Dr. Wen Liang, who um, you know, had sounded the alarm in Wuhan. This is a, another question from someone watching who wanted to know whether the, of course he died uh, tragically. Uh, one of the uh, sort of whistleblowers who told the, the story tragically died, wondering whether or not the filmmakers um, ever encountered him or ran across crossed paths with him, as the listener said. No, I, I think uh, Dr. Li Wenliang got sick in late January, shortly after um, the lockdown happened. And he was in the hospital for for a period of time before he passed away. I think he passed away in early February and the entire country of China went into mourning over his death because he symbolized the courage to, to, to speak up uh, despite pressure from, uh, at that time, as far as we understand, the local government, the provincial and the municipal government really is trying to suppress it because for political reasons, they, they didn't want to disturb their uh, political convention that's happening in January, as well as the Chinese New Year. So um, we, we, like I mentioned earlier, we did interview two other whistleblowers, not as high profile as Dr. Li Wenliang. We tried to get access to, to talk to one of his colleagues who was also a whistleblower herself, but we couldn't get access to her. Um, and so we, we really, uh, my filmmaking team did, really didn't get a chance to sort of pass anybody who worked with him. Uh, but in the end, we decided not to tell his story just because his story is so familiar at the same yeah. time, especially yeah. with being so well reported in China. So yeah, it's somehow just bring his story in doesn't sort of doesn't go with the, the footage we, we, we have access to. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that you, you you talked about is that what you wanted for the film was to show how human beings help each other live through these these catastrophes. So in the end, and we talked a little bit about this on the radio, but I wanted to, to get you to say a little bit more about what you think we learned. You know, what did this reveal about about humankind? Um, um, and and who we are, you know, as 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 people. Um, yeah, I, I I think I read a lot about past pandemics while I was making this film, especially, obviously, the obvious targets were Black Death, right? And also the Spanish flu, as well as yeah. the AIDS pandemic. So, you know, if you read history, sometimes you can get quite discouraged because every single time a pandemic happens, uh, it's in human nature to blame some other groups for our own failures, first of all. And uh, sometimes the ugly side of human nature is that we want to save ourselves. Uh, that uh, comes up. 
but as as I start reading about the AIDS pandemic and you know to fully understand how the entire society, not just the Reagan administration, but also we all had faults, right? In terms of not being able to recognize the severity and, 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 take, and taking it seriously in the very beginning. But at the same time, it's just they are courageous doctors and medical researchers that, that just went against the conventional wisdom to, to, to championing for research and for public health measures. And then looking at the footage my co-director have shot and listening to stories, because I was in New York, every night at seven o'clock, I hear the banging of the pots, people cheering for the medical workers, yeah. right? And then I was talking to my filmmaker friends in Milan, and they were doing volunteer work, trying to deliver groceries for the seniors who were locked inside our apartments. So at the same time, there's still a glimmer of hope that we're still capable of being kind to each other, to 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 uh, to step up, you know, like the especially in the medical workers, like here as well, right? We have we have people coming like when you, when it got really bad in New York, the medical staff and workers came from all over the U.S. to come here to support New York, and so we have those stories. So in some ways, uh, I don't know. I just feel like it was a tough time editing this film because I was going through my own personal stress and guilt and sadness. And uh, I just feel like I want to kind of sort of like hold on to that gleam of hope, try to, try, to, try to encourage people to see hope and to see how we can work together and, and survive this together. How, well, what's next? What other projects do you have in mind? Now you've You've, um, this is a successful film, I think by anyone's standards. And, and, and uh, as you say, there's a lot of buzz about, uh, it's a contender for the Oscars. People are, a, a lot of amazing reviews and a lot of really extraordinary reaction. Uh, a, a verite film, are you gonna stick with that style? Um, now, are you working on something else? What's, what's next for you? Yeah, I'm working on a documentary about the lawsuit against Harvard for affirmative action, which the, the lawsuit might, the case might go to the Supreme Court this year. Uh, so I'm working on a film, um, doing early production on that film, but you know, in, in COVID time, it's really challenging to be traveling. Um, it's a film. great idea for a film, by the way. That's yeah. a great idea. If anybody who knows the Harvard people, let me know in the audience. I want to get <laughs> access to them. <laughs> uh, and also developing a, num a, a couple of other unscripted and also as well as scripted projects. Great. Well, I just want to thank you for. Before we go, I do want to say so. So there were some um, uh, people who are going to want to see this again. Um, where can they experience it again? M MTV is showing it. Um, do, can you, do you know the, the times for that, the dates for that? So we're still trying to figure out uh, within the Viacom network, where, where are we gonna do the, we're gonna, which channel we're gonna do the TV broadcast or, or do the streaming. But uh, this coming Saturday, January 23rd is the one year anniversary of the start of the lockdown. So MTV Documentary Films is doing a free viewing day. So, so you can, you know, go to your local, your favorite local art house cinema or, or come to visit 76daysfilm.com where you can watch the film for free in virtual cinema. And for every viewing, MTV is gonna donate $5 to the, you know, art house cinema of your choice to support the, the, the independent uh, theaters. So it's a great way to tell your friends, I you know, would love to have as many people watch this as possible on the special day, the first year anniversary. So we will never forget. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that, that's great. We'll put the link to that on our website as yeah. well. Thank you to those who uh, tuned in this evening to, to be with us. And Haolu, thank you very much for being so generous with your time. And again, congratulations. It's really such a great piece of work. Thank you so much, Doc. Thanks for joining the audience. Thanks very much, everyone. Good night. Okay. Have a good night.